All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, there'll be more up on as we as we get going. So, welcome everyone to the um, let's talk bass fishing um, with Pradco Outdoors. Um, that's if if this isn't the class you thought you were, welcome. You know, come join us. Um, so this is a uh, this is our second webinar in a in a series that we have um, that we are doing with uh, Pradco Outdoor Brands. And um, we also have our uh, Arkansas Game and Fish biologists that we'll get into here in just a minute. They're going to join us. Um, but just to kind of start us all off, I'm Danielle Simmons. I am an educator with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. I'm actually based out of Fort Smith, Arkansas at uh, one of our nature centers, which is one of five nature centers the Game and Fish has throughout the state. And I am just the host. So um, these wonderful gentlemen are going to be talking tonight and I am going to be learning and listening and enjoying it. Um, and I will also be the one that will be monitoring our chat. So um, just some housekeeping before we get started. In Zoom, if you've never been on Zoom before, um, we are in a webinar. So what happens is you can see us four panelists and we cannot see or hear you. So. Don't feel bad if you're eating Cheetos on the couch. We can't see it. Not that we would judge. Um, so you are just fine. Uh, we can't see or hear you, but we will be um, utilizing the chat. So um, if you haven't found it yet, if you will look either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on if you're on a desktop or, um, do they even call them desktops anymore? If you're on a computer, tablet, or if you're on your mobile device, um, there is a thumbnail. So you'll you'll see something that looks like um, you'll have chat. You should have um, raise your hand. You should have um, something that uh, shows you can end so you can leave. So finding that thumbnail, and you'll see where it has a little chat box. And most of y'all have already been using it. But um, just in case we haven't, I've already asked you to tell me where you are um, where you are from, but just for giggles, if you will, one more time, let's see, um, let's have y'all all put in, so I know we're here for bass fishing, right? But go ahead and put in the chat what your favorite type of fish to eat. So go ahead and put that in the chat and then just let, let's see what everyone's responses are. Probably same, buffalo, pike, probably walleye. Have to be walleye. <laughs> I've never had walleye. It's hard to beat. Is it? Mm-hmm. Crappies, I'm, man. I'm Crappies not, good too, for sure. Crappie, man. Bass, catfish. Crappie. Mm. Brim. Yep. Vegetarian. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> bass, catfish. I've actually never had bass before. Never had it, but everyone I've spoken to says it's actually really good. It is. Stan, you say trout. I love trout, but those little bones, they always give me. I'm kind of a wimp. Cool. All right. So it seems like everybody's got uh, use of the chat. That's great. Um, if you have questions throughout the evening, you can use that chat to ask questions, and I will be here watching. So the gentlemen that are speaking, they don't, I mean, they'll probably watch as they go, but um, I'll be the one that'll kind of be monitoring it, and then uh, I'll pop in every once in a while to ask the questions for everybody. So if you do have questions, please feel free to engage on the chat. That way we can make this more of a conversation. So we're not just doing lectures. We're actually going to have some conversations with everyone. Um, so if you have any questions, use that. Um, also, just kind of talking about, we are with Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Um, so we are funded by your hunting and fishing licenses. So um, those of you that have bought your fishing and hunting license, we want to say thank you so much for supporting us. Um, at the Nature Center, I'm actually funded by the one cent conservation tax, um, which so it's kind of cool whenever we combine the, you know, you paid your taxes, so you get to come here and hang out with us, and um, we get to do lots of fun things. So um, just letting y'all know, thank y'all so much for supporting us, um, and that helps us do the things that we we're doing tonight, and we keep continuing to do so. so. So to start the evening off, I'm going to have our uh, biologists go ahead and introduce themselves and just kind of let you know who they are. And um, Vic, would you like to start us off? Sure, Danielle. Um, my name is Vic Desenzo. I work with Jeff. I'm a Black Bass Program Coordinator with Arkansas Game and Fish. In the Fisheries Division, we work statewide on 
black bass uh, science and research and management issues. We work with habitat projects. Um, in <clears throat> black bass in, in Arkansas are largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, and spotted bass. So I'll turn it over to Jeff now. Yeah, my name's Jeff Buckingham. Uh, like Vic said, I uh, work in the Black Bass program alongside him. I am out of the Hot Springs office. So my uh, office is at Andrew Halsey Hatchery, uh, right on the shores of Lake Hamilton. Um, and like you said, we do a little bit of stuff statewide trying to make bass fishing better in the state. So uh, Jeff and Vic, just for um, clarification, um, so when you say black bass, can you tell what species you're talking about? Yeah, like, like Vic said, it's the largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, and spotted bass. Um, just those three species. Um, we don't work with white bass or striped bass or any of them. It's, uh, those are a different family of fish. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, and then we will have Dustin, who is with Pradco Outdoors, go ahead and introduce himself. Yes, ma'am. I, I, my name is Dustin Elder. I work for Pradco Outdoor Brands as our pro staff manager. Uh, and what Pradco is, we are a company that has fishing lure brands. We're a brand manufacturer. And you probably haven't heard of Pradco, but I guarantee you've probably heard of some of the brands that we have. And that's like War Eagle Custom Lures or Booyah Bait Company. Or I know you've probably seen these Yum, all over Walmart, Academy, any stores like that. that that's what we are. We're a fishing lure brands. And I'm the pro staff manager at Pradco. What I do is I work very closely with our pro staff members like uh, Jason Christie or Stetson Blaylock or people of that nature. I work with them. And then I also work in our, uh, our product development team. I work really closely building some of these products that we'll actually get to talk about tonight and in the rest of our series. So um, for y'all that are in the chat, if y'all don't mind, if you've ever used any of the, um, some of the stuff that Dustin just mentioned, can y'all put in there what y'all have used? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Probably a yum dinger or. That's one of my brother's favorites. Like he. He's that's all... the best. It catches everything. Yes. Or maybe that's... a frog, like a pad crasher or a toad runner or. Mm -hmm. Booyah, umbrellas. Yep. The spinner baits for the win. There we go. War Eagle spinner baits and yum dingers. Yeah. I'd hear that. Yeah. That's awesome. Old school go bomber crankbaits. War Eagle's my go to spinner bait. There you go. Awesome. That's great. So cool. 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 So you may not have heard Pradco, but you definitely do know the product. So, um, all right. So, Dustin, if you want to go ahead and get us started in on tonight's topic. Yes, ma'am. That would be great. Uh, tonight's topic is power fishing, and we've related it to fishing around the spawn, but this can go spawn, post-spawn, really any time from mid-March to about May is what we're going to talk about today. But the topic is power fishing, and a lot of people, you know, they know about what power fishing is, but I'm going to give just kind of a definition for it, and that is fishing fast, fishing lures that have a lot of movement to them, have flash like a spinnerbait, Things using heavy action rods, big line, big heavy fluorocarbon, monofilament, or braid. And it's, it's fun fishing is what I consider it. Whenever you can power fish, you're fishing fast, you're moving down a bank, you're, you know, when you catch a fish, it tends to be a better one because you're throwing a faster or a bigger lure. And uh, Danielle, is, is there any way we can show that short video that I sent you earlier? We've got a, a good video here. It's one of our product videos at Yum that our product director did that, uh, pretty much spells out what power fishing is, or this guy himself is power fishing, and you'll know the definition for sure when you see the excitement that he has. There we go. I don't know if we'll ever get the sound to it actually, but if you're not able to get the sound, you can at least see just the way he's fishing. And there we go. There he is. Boy, he was hot, wasn't he? Yeah. So fun swimming a soft plastic through shallow vegetation like the grass, like what we're doing. We've got a bait at Yum that's absolutely dynamite for doing that. And it's the Yum Spine Crawl. This one's all jacked up. Let me put my poles down real quick. And I'm going to show you this bait. 
This is it. This is the Yum Spine Crawl. We built this bait for one specific reason, and that's for a fast flutter. So these claws are going to rapidly flutter like that right there. It's got spines on the side. It's going to move a lot of water. Use a four aught and five aught hook with it. It works great. Quick, rapid movement for Texas rigging, Carolina rigging. It's very versatile. That's the Yum Spine Crawl. That, in an essence, is power fishing. Mr. Chad Warner, he's my boss, he's our product director. He is power fishing. He's excited. He's setting the hook hard. He's, you know, swimming that bait as fast as you possibly can. In my mind, that that is power fishing. That is going down a bank that's fishing shallow, typically, throwing something like that, a moving bait, which is a, a young spine crawl, like I've got right here, a soft plastic crawl. That's throwing a, a crank bait or something of that nature, but moving fast and just, you know, trying to catch the biggest fish possible. Power fishing, how it relates to the spawn is, you know, during the spawn time, a pre-spawn, post-spawn, all that, bass are shallow. So you're able to use a lot of these lures that we that we really enjoy, such as the spinner bait or the shallow crank bait or like a, a crawdad style lure on a Texas rig. And when they're shallow like that, you're able to do this power fishing per se. The two power fish, there needs to be conditions in order to be able to, you know, achieve that type of technique. Uh, these conditions are typically, uh, you know, adverse for a lot of anglers. That's high winds, that's uh, overcast conditions, rain, anything of that nature that makes the water a little bit off colored or it gives a little bit of chop on the surface, something to kind of distort these fish. That is what you're looking for when it comes to power fishing. Now, for the spawn, like we're leading up to right now, I mean, it's, was it March 17th right now with these 70 degree days that we're having? Within the next week or so, these lures will become in play, like everywhere in Arkansas. I know we were talking about Greer's Ferry earlier about how the water was too cold up there. Well, I know you're probably experiencing some 60 or 70 degree days, just like people in Rogers are, people down here in Hot Springs are feeling. So within the next week or two, power fishing is going to be something that everyone will be able to employ. It's look for days where you've got, you've got wind, you might have a little bit of rain, you might, you might not think it's the best fishing day, but that's whenever you want to pull out these, these baits like spinner bait or anything that you can move fast. Go fish shallow, go fish around pockets, fish anywhere that bass might be spawning, which typically is, you know, soft ground areas and pockets uh, in creeks or anywhere of that nature. Uh, I'll hand it over to our biologists here. They can elaborate a lot more on where bass like to spawn and, you know, the conditions for bass spawning. Yeah, um, whenever that water gets into the 60s, yeah, the bass are going to start looking to spawn and uh, at least for largemouth, uh, all the black bass for that matter, the spawn really means something different for male and female bass. They're both gonna behave a little bit differently. The, uh, you know, the males are gonna get up and start looking to spawn a little earlier. They gotta get up there and create their nest, um, find a spot that they can do it. They're gonna be looking for um, gravel, a stump, something hard that they can spawn on and make their nest on. So. Uh, for a male, yeah, they're going to get up there, build their nest. Um, when the female does come up there, uh, eventually they got to fertilize the eggs and then guard those fry once they do hatch. So the spawn for male bass does last a lot longer than it does for females. Now, the females, they're going to come up there. Their job is to lay the eggs. And I think one thing that's really interesting that a lot of people don't know is that a female, a lot of, oftentimes, she's going to spawn in more than one nest and that's her that's her way of being able to kind of um if that one if that first one fails on her then she's kind of got a safeguard that you know she's she's put eggs in multiple nests so um that, that's better chances for her being able to kind of spread her gene or put her genes into future generations so um her her time frame's a little bit shorter but um she you know this again a, one of the best times of year to try catching one of those big fish when they're up shallow. So um, I think that's all I had to add. I don't know if Vic has anything to add to that. Yeah, that's great stuff, Jeff. And, and Dustin's going to be over the course of this series is going to be offering a lot of fishing tech techniques at various stages of the spawn. And the one thing that you need to understand is that not all the fish in a lake or a river spawn the same week. So this spawning time might go six to eight weeks, and typically the larger fish will spawn earlier. 
So at any given time in April, you could have fish that are post-spawn, actively spawning, and still pre-spawn. So as you listen to all of these great techniques and these, um, these the different tackle and lures, understand that be adaptive and, and be ready to change at any moment and react to what the fish are doing, react to what the conditions are. Dustin talked about uh, chop on the water and wind versus clear days and still days. So just be ready to, to be adaptable and try a variety of techniques. Thank you all. That's, that's really good notes. I mean, it's, it's, that's the best thing to note is six to eight weeks. I mean, this is a very long process and these fish will be in all different stages. You can still catch fish right now on an umbrella rig like we talked about in our last class. And you might even be able to get close to catching one on a top water here soon. I mean, they, they could be in all different types of moods and in all different types of settings within this, you know, what we call, I guess, a spawn calculator, like which ones are going up, which ones are moving back. Uh, it really, it seems to me, it's just a, an old fishing guy, is that the spawn just brings these fish close to the bank where you can actually catch them. And a lot of our lakes, like Beaver, Greer's Ferry, Hamilton, Washita, Bass, are, they're, they're deep a lot of times, like throughout the year, and they're hard to catch. I mean, we've got live scope and, you know, good sonar and everything now to be able to catch these fish, but it, it's still really hard. When it puts them up shallow, it, it just eliminates a lot of water, and it helps you to where you can catch fish a lot easier. So I, I definitely recommend getting out as much as you possibly can right now. We've got some really great lakes and it's just a good time to catch fish. But one thing I wanted to ask y'all biologists, I'm, I'm just going to dig into some things that I really want to know was I always wonder like which fish are going to spawn first. Like do, do spotted bass normally go up there first? It seems like I'm always, I'm always finding them first or I'm finding them last or maybe there's just more of them in the lake. But is there a science behind that? Do certain fish move up first? We've done some, we, the fisheries profession in general, have, have studied um, spawning times and durations of all the different black bass species. And um, it seems that the, the fish that might tend to prefer a little bit cooler water, like a spotted bass or a smallmouth, might come up a little bit sooner. But again, it's going to be over that time, that, that long time, uh, time frame. I think the thing to understand is that the bigger fish are going to come up and, and spawn first. And there's, there's sort of a size difference and size variation in, in from, say, late March to mid-May. You might see the larger fish on average spawning earlier and the smaller, younger fish spawning later. And it probably has something to do with selection of, of uh, ideal habitat. Okay. So you've got a couple of questions. Um, so... Tom asked, what about on the river? So when you were talking about the spawn, like with the lakes, since they're so deep most of the time, uh, what about on the rivers? Typically river water, shallow water is gonna warm up faster. So you'll have, you know, these conditions like this six to eight weeks of bass moving up and spawning, you'll typically on the Arkansas River, Dardanelle, places like that, it'll be a little bit quicker process. I was talking to a, a, one of my pro staff guys at Dardanelle last week, Sawyer Grace, and he was telling me the bass were already spawning. It was still kind of cold. Like he's found fish up shallow spawning near stumps, like Jeff was talking about earlier. He's found fish deep, still catching them on an umbrella rig. So that's the thing with river water is since it's shallow and it warms up quicker, you, you really got to be ready, just like Vic was saying, to change up as much as possible because wherever you go, there might be something different. You might go into this pocket that there's been sun shining in a lot and they're going to be up shallow. They're going to be eating something like a, like a yum dinger flipping shallow. And then if you go into the next pocket that's more wooded, that's, you know, stays cold, they're going to be backed off. They're going to be a little bit deeper. So as far as the rivers go, you know, they can warm up faster and they can also get cold faster. So you need to keep a lot of things going and not just settle in on one thing. You need to have lots of options available. Does the, does like a heavy rainfall kind of affect them more easily with a river versus like a lake? It sure does. I mean, you can definitely have things muddy up a lot quicker and a river is going to, it's going to move up a lot faster and that, that seems to mess with all the, the fish spawning. I know you biologists can talk about that a lot more. It seems like we always have a big rain during the spawn and it just moves, just moves things around, messes things up, or the, you know, somebody will drop the lake or the river or something, and it'll drop and you'll see beds sitting up on the bank. That, that water level really has something to do with it, doesn't it? Absolutely. And the other thing with the rivers and the flows change so much, and it seems like we get a hundred year flood every two years now. And mm -hmm. um, what you really want to target this time of year is some of those protected areas where you can get away from the flow a little bit um, because 
if you've got really high water, it's going to blow that nest out. And that's why we that's why we tend to see poor reproduction more frequently in river systems. Jeff Jeff's got a lot more experience on on the Arkansas River. Might be able to add something. Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. Um, I mean, we pretty much document any year that we have a big flooding event. The natural recruitment is pretty limited those years. So, um, you know, we do stock in the Arkansas River. It's one of our places where we can feel like our stocking probably does add to the population. Um, the natural recruitment in most of our lakes in the state is the bass have no problem spawning in them. Even when the water drops out on some of our Corps of Engineer lakes like Beaver Lake or something like that, there's still bass out there spawning um, and a lot of them that they, they are able to carry the, the population. But um, yeah, the, the rivers are just a whole different animal. And uh, like Vic said, when you're getting more and more flooding events, it is just more and more chances that bass aren't going to be able to pull off a spawn, but they are resilient. You know, they do find places where they can get out of the current and they'll find a log or a stump or something to spawn on and, and, and pull it off. I mean, that's one nice thing about bass is they really are resilient. Yeah, Jeff, that's a great point. The other thing I want to point out is that um, bass are habitat generalists, so they don't need a particular habitat type to spawn. Um, stumps, like Jeff said, are an ideal place to target when you're looking for spawning bass, gravel beds, any sort of feature. I, I know sometimes in hatcheries, Jeff, don't they lay down mats for the bass to spawn on? Yeah, that's, that's how they spawn them here at Andrew Halsey Hatchery is they'll put down a, like a welcome mat more or less and um, the bass will spawn on that and that's how they're able to collect the eggs in the pond is um, they love spawning on that. That's really cool. Well, to, to jump into something, you know, a little bit different here is getting back into power fishing. I'd like to just talk about a few techniques and lures that we have at Fradco that I, I think can catch you a lot of fish this time of year. Some stuff I've been using this past week and plan to do this weekend as well. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is a spinnerbait. This is a War Eagle tandem willow spinnerbait. But the neat thing about this for a uh, for spawn time, as you can notice on there, it has a red kicker blade. This is a real secret deal that I've noticed, you know, across Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas during the spawn. What that red does is it just gives them a target. It gives them a focal point when they're up shallow to actually hit this spinnerbait. This is a great bait this time of year. If you get a little bit of wind, you can move down some banks, get, it, get yourself into a creek or a pocket, you run the bank, look for stumps. It lay down just like Vic and Jeff were saying, sitting out of the water. Slow roll this dude by him with some, some heavy lines, some 15 to 20 pound fluorocarbon. You're very likely to get a bite. This is a you know old time lure, but it still catches a lot of big fish. Another lure that's a, it's a newer one, and feel free to stop me if there's any questions or anything anybody wants to step in on here. Uh, a newer lure is a, a Booyah Melee bladed jig. Bladed jig has been a it's been a really big lure. You know, gosh, the past few years won a lot of big tournaments. And I know the Bassmasters Classic been one on it before, things like that. What this is, this is basically a, just a jig head with a small blade on the front of it. And it just kind of clacks back and forth, gives some motion. This is really great around grass. If you've got a lake or a pond or anything like that where you have grass, you can fish this bait above it. You can let it fall into the grass and you can rip it out. Great bait just to kind of, you know, attack grass or any shallow cover with kind of like spinner bait, except you can throw it a lot more places. Hey, Dustin, um, Eric asked, um, are you, with the spinner bait, are you ripping the spinner bait or slow rolling? Oh, this time of year, I'm just, I'm just trying to throw it and burn it. I'm throwing this thing and reeling it pretty quick. I'm throwing it on like a six or seven speed casting reel, and I'm just casting out there trying to get as subtle of an entry into the water as possible, like to hit next to a stump or something. Be, be very subtle. You want that thing just to barely bloop like a pin dropping in the water and then just bring it out as quickly as I possibly can. I don't want them to have a very good look at it. That tends to, to get you the most bites. And then Paul and Heather, they ask, what about body color, light versus dark? Oh, that's a good question. That's a great question. And, and I would say as far as uh, your, your watercolor goes at your certain lake, that's what I want to base it on. If you've got dark water, go with something like a chartreuse and white, something really bright with like a gold frame and gold blades. These shine really brightly in dark water. But if you got really clear water, 
go with something that's like a translucent, a shad pattern, a, a glimmer type of color that's got a nickel blades on it because that shines a little bit better in clear water and it looks more like a shad. And then you have add trailers and, or let the body do the work. Uh, as far as the spinner bait, sometimes add a trailer and that's just depending if you need, if you need to cast a little farther, I like to throw a trailer. But most of the time I don't, especially with these War Eagle spinner baits, they kind of have a built-in trailer already on them. They've got this longer skirt. So I, I tend not to, it makes it simpler. But as far as something like this, uh, this bladed jig here, I always like to add a trailer to it. I like to pair it up with a typically a crawdad or a swim bait style plastic, kind of like this Yum Spine Craw. You just pair it up with something like this. It's got some kick to it. You just add that to it. So you've got, you know, you got the head moving back and forth and you've also got the claws or the tail kicking in the back. That's, that's the best way to use this bladed jig. Dustin, Next I don't appreciate you talking about the bladed jig. That's my springtime bait. So <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. man. You it let seems everybody like know you, about it. It used to be a secret and now it's kind of it's kind of getting out. People are winning tournaments on it. Everybody used to just kind of hold it in their hand and not let anybody see it, but now it's it seems like it's becoming pretty mainstream. Yeah, no doubt it's a good bait. Mm -hmm. Uh Juan said, um, oh wait, hold on. So one of I, I use lizards a lot during the spawn. Any tips? Uh, for a lizard, really, make as many pitches and flips as possible. If you're going to put it on a Texas rig, you want that thing to land next to every single piece of small cover, and then just kind of lightly hop it. If you're doing that, if you're just flipping around in shallow water, make as many flips as you can, give it a couple of hops, and bring it back out. You can also put it on a Carolina rig. That's a really good option this time of year. What that is, that's a, that's a small weight. You've got a long leader line. You can pull it through shallow water. That's a really great way to fish a lizard if you haven't. I didn't bring one here to talk about it, but you, you can always get on YouTube and they have some really great tutorials on how to rig that up. On the War Eagle, what was the weight on it? Was it three eight ounce? It's a three eighths. This is a War Eagle River Rat is what it's called. And they only come in three eighths of an ounce. Uh, how much does, don't are asking really good questions. This is, mm -hmm. um, how much does blade color matter on a bladed jig or a chatterbait? It doesn't seem like it really matters. Most of them just kind of match up with the color of the head. I've never really noticed any difference because whenever we were designing this bait, all of them just had silver blades. They might have a black head, but a silver blade. And we caught the same amount of fish as compared to one that had the anodized black blade. So it doesn't really matter as much as like your skirt color and like the trailer you're using on it. All right. So Dustin, do you have like a go-to, like your favorite skirt color and your favorite outfit? Favorite outfit. I mean, this one right here, because there's so much dirty water this time of year, and that's a black and blue. You can't go wrong with the black and blue. It all it always seems to work. You got dirty water. Good stuff. All right. I think that's all the questions for now. All right. Well, just the next lure to jump into, it's one that everyone knows about, and that is a, a shallow crankbait, a, a square bill crankbait. This is a Booyah XCS. It's just a it's a square bill crankbait, comes in two sizes, half ounce and three quarters ounce. It's got just a, just a big protruding square lip on it. I don't know if you can see it that well out there. This is perfect for just throwing shallow and digging over shallow cover like stumps, rocks, anything that's just right up against the bank. Perfect for that. Uh, throw this bait on a typically a, what you call a moderate action rod, something with a lot of bend to it, something you can cast out there and you can, you know, you can feel it moving against the rocks. And whenever you get a bite, you can set the hook but not pull those treble hooks out of a fish's mouth. This is a great bait, just like a spinner bait, just for going down the bank, casting, winding. You know, eventually you're going to hear a knock one in the head, you're going to catch a good one. Next thing I want to talk about, which is what everyone kind of thinks of with uh, power fishing during the spawn, and that is a, it's a Texas rig. That is a Texas rig, a crawl, a creature bait, or maybe a yum dinger, something like this. And that's just, you know, taking you a little, Wide gap hook, just like that, and just piercing the top of that lure, bringing it down, and rigging it back up into your plastic, just like that. This allows the bait to be very weedless. But you're just taking this, a crawdad or a, or a yum dinger like I have here, you're just taking this with a small weight on it, and you're just pitching it around shallow cover. You're what we call flipping or pitching. You're just pitching it, bringing it up next to every piece of cover, 
and just working it as quickly as you can, flipping it just like we were talking about that lizard earlier, flipping up against cover, giving it a couple hops, pulling it back out, throwing it back in there. This is a, just a great bait just to get a lot of bites this time of year. Brett asked, what advantage does a square bill crankbait offer over conventional rounded bill design? A square bill, well, because of that square design, it's going to deflect off of cover. Whenever you run a, just a regular round bill, it's typically going to run into cover. It's not going to run away from it. It's going to just kind of dive into it and get caught up. It's better for going over rock or things down deep. The square bill, it can come through wood or just any type of cover like that because it's going to hit with one of those sides of that you know, square lip and it's going to deflect. And oftentimes that's what's going to cause your bite. Most of the time, whenever you're catching fish power fishing, they're not hungry. They're not up there trying to eat something that looks good. They're just, they're just doing it off reaction. You're knocking that bait off of something or you're moving something with that red blade. They're just reacting to it and jumping and getting a hold of it because they're mad. So that's, that's what a square bill has over a round bill. Another lure that's great this time of year, just like talking about a Texas rig, is just a, a flipping jig. This is a booyah bankroll jig. This is just good for flipping into shallow cover like trees, laydowns, rocks, docks, anything like that that might be on your lake or pond. You can just flip it, pull it back out, flip it, just kind of let the jig do its work and hop on the bottom. Then the last bait that I want to talk about with power fishing during the spawn is my absolute favorite. And as soon as that water gets into 60 degrees, I want to pull this bait out. That is a buzz bait. This is the most fun bait I think that, that any company makes on this earth because it gets such ferocious bites. I mean, fish have seen it a million times, but they still just jump completely out of the water and land on top of it every spring. What this thing does is uh, it has a weighted head on it, has a little blade here. And what you do is you just throw it out, pull it up to the surface, and let that blade clack, hit back and forth, and it creates kind of a little bubble trail and makes a little squealing noise, and it just kind of goes right over the top of bass and they can't stand it, especially when they're spawning. This thing is absolutely great. Um, oh, oh, gosh. Um, <coughs> put a trailer on, on the jig? On the jig, yes. Always put a trailer like this young spine craw. I always like to have one of them, just some type of crawdad or a creature bait, something that's got a little bit of movement to it, some leg kick. That, that's what you want on the back of that jig. Um. What about the moon phases? I think that might be uh, Jeff and Vic. Uh, right now, like it's a full moon. Does that have affected any? Yeah, um, bass typically like to come and spawn around a full moon or a new moon. Um, you know, it's going to also matter with water temperature and length of day also plays into it. But um, you know, a lot of times if you get all three of those things line up, that's probably about your peak spawn. So um, probably a little early yet right now. I think, yeah, we were close to a full moon. It's not already on one, but um, the next new moon or even our next full moon, things will be, be going pretty good, I think. But again, you're going to be spawning regardless, you know, throughout the whole time. I mean, it's, um, they're not going to just wait for that full moon to spawn. Um, if conditions line up between day length and water temperature, they're going to be ready to go. Um, is there a certain weight and length for that square bill that you had, Dustin? Certain weight and length, yes. On our larger size, which is the XCS2, it is two and three quarters inches. It weighs five eighths of an ounce or three quarters, basically. And then the smaller one right here, it's two inches long and it weighs half an ounce. Uh. Does the buzz bait color, does the buzz bait blade color matter to the fish? I personally don't think so, but I mean, it catches fishermen when they're in the store. This one caught my eye because it has this, uh, this blade that kind of matches up with the head. I, I think it's cool. I mean, it might have, it might be something they can target a little bit better. So it, it might help. I, I'm really not sure exactly. Hey, uh, Jeff, Vic, what, when you were talking about the bubbles, is there any like signs behind the fish like really going after like things that cause that kind of trail or anything? Cause a commotion. Yeah. Not that I know of. Uh, maybe Vic knows of something. I haven't read anything about that, but it would be interesting. <laughs> That'd be a fun project, but I'm not aware of anything. Yeah, we could put, we could put it on our packages if so. <laughs> we'll have to find a college student to do some research for us, right? Yeah, scientifically proven by Jeff and Vic. 
<laughs> Sorry. That counts. It's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Bob, so Bob asked, was there a skirt on that rig or a skirt on the buzz bait? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Actually, I'm kind of weird. I always pull all the skirts off of my buzz baits. And the reason for that is I take them. I take something like this. Uh, this is a uh, Jean LaRue Biffle Bug Jr. I take this or a, like a, a yum tiptoed or something of that nature. And I place it on there as a trailer instead of having a skirt. This gives it a little bit more action and it gives them something to bite down on whenever they actually, you know, clamp onto it. Something like that right there. It gives a little bit more action as it coming across the water. It looks a little more, more natural. That's, that's what I tend to do. And it, it seems to get more bites. It really does. And you can skip it. If you're fishing around docks or lay down trees, you can take this thing and whiz it back in there and skip it on that plastic. Awesome. Uh, Paul and Heather said they would volunteer for that research project, by the way. Me too. Let's get together. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. I think we're good on questions for now. Okay. Uh, well, I have, I have just one more lure here to talk about, and that's, you know, it goes along with the top lures we were talking about, and that's just a, a small soft plastic frog. This is a Booyah Toad Runner Jr. It's really cool. It's got a, a small rotating tail on the back, so it creates a commotion kind of like a buzz bait. But any type of frog, we have a small pad crasher frog from Booyah. It's just a really good weedless presentation because those hooks are buried up in the plastic. You can take this bait and you can throw it way back in the weeds or a brush pile or any type of lay down on the bank, work that bait out, and you're not going to get hung up. So it's, it's really friendly for new anglers. And it, it you know, gets a lot of bites, just like this buzz bait. Whenever you've got a fish up shallow that's on a, on a nest, you can work that over them, make them mad, and they'll come up and bite that thing. Uh, one said, I catch and release. Do I handle the bass differently during the spawning season? I mean, you know, if you're just catching and releasing, um, you know, if you, especially if you're catching them off the bed, if you release it right there, it's going to find its way back to the, to the beds pretty quickly. Um, and, they'll, and they'll typically be shallow, so you don't have to worry about any sort of <clears throat> pressure problems that fish would require fizzing or anything like that so yeah. just get them back in the water as quick as you can when they're when they're not in the spawn and is that is a pressure thing you want to be mindful of with catch and release whenever you're doing like deep water when they're in the deeper water um yeah that's typically during winter and summer when you're catching fish out of 20 plus feet of water uh they can fish can experience barrel trap Barrel trauma, which is kind of like if a diver's coming up too fast, um, they get the bends. Um, it's the same kind of thing. And it just doesn't allow their air inside the fish doesn't allow them to swim back down. Now, if you're catching and releasing um, and you throw the fish back right away, the fish usually has enough energy to go back down real quick. So um, having to treat it yourself doesn't isn't typically a thing, but if you're a tournament angler, and you put it in live well, those fish typically end up needing a treatment then if they are experiencing barrel trauma. So um, just depends if you're just out there catching and releasing, usually not something you have to worry about as long as you get the fish back in the water as soon as you can. That's, I never would have thought of that. That's fascinating. Okay. Um, uh, Paul and Heather said, frog versus big bug pattern. Is there a better or is it about the presentation? Oh, uh, I think that, that they mean buzz bait or frog. That's what I'm guessing. I'm guessing, uh, honestly, I'm going to use this buzz bait if I'm not fishing around as much cover. If I'm just covering barren banks or fishing around a little bit of grass or something, I'll use the buzz bait. Now, if I'm fishing really, you know, really thick cover, like heavy grass, logs, lay down stuff that I'm going to get hung up on, I'm going to choose the frog. Uh, they said top water bug patterns. Oh, bug patterns. Uh, I typically don't use anything that's really colored up too much like a bug. Like right now, I've got this green pumpkin one on, and that's just because it's, it's what I had. I had it laying on my boat. I normally use like a wide or a shad pattern with top water. I want it to look like a minnow. Why, why don't you use the bug patterns? Oh, uh, well, I mean, typically with things that are moving around on top, they're always going to be a shad or a minnow jumping around. I, I mean, sometimes you see cicadas or different things like that flying on the water. That's a whole different situation, but I always just make it simple. I choose something that's got a white belly, white or chartreuse or something that looks similar to a shad. It's, it's just been easy for me to do that for many years and catch fish on it. Uh, what's, oh, 
What's the lowest temp you use uh, the frog? Uh, I like to think 60 degrees. If the bass are spawning and they're up shallow, I'll, th I'll throw a frog. If I know they're up there, I'll throw it. Uh, okay, I think that's all the questions. That's all the questions so far. Okay, cool. Uh, well, the, the next little feature I had here was I reached out to several pro staff members across the state and just asked them for a general report in case anyone is going to go out fishing this weekend. Uh, starting with you here at Lake Washita, I spoke with uh, different fishing guides that are out here and the, the fishing's starting to get better here. The water temp was seen in the low 50s to mid 50s this week. Uh, fish are actually starting to try to make their move up shallow, especially with the rest of these 70 degree days this weekend. Uh, catching fish up the river, up the North Fork, places like that on a spinnerbait, a bladed jig, things of that nature. Uh, also catching fish still in pre-spawn patterns like a uh, umbrella rig, things of that nature. Uh, we have a question there. Yes. <laughs> Uh, spray scents effective on bait? Very. I say they're very, very effective, especially something like a soft plastic crawl or something that you're going to be soaking in front of the fish's face. They're very effective. Just, you know, any of them work great. We make some at Yum that smell like shad and crawdad and garlic. Anything like that works great, in my opinion. Or it, it makes me think it does. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all in our heads a lot of times. The stinkier, the better. Mm hmm and then you have, uh, how do you fish an umbrella rig? An umbrella rig? Well, uh, that's a really complex deal. We could actually have a class just on fishing the umbrella rig. Uh, but to put it basically, uh, for someone just getting started out in it, I would recommend getting one and get you a rod and reel to throw it on, like a 7.6 to 7.10, a big long rod because it weighs a lot, uh, heavy action. Get you some heavy fluorocarbon line, like 20 or 25. Tie that thing on, get you some jig heads, some just small eighth or three sixteenth ounce jig heads, and get you a, a swim bait of choice. Get your favorite swim bait or a grub, and you rig it up with five of those on there. Go out to, you know, your favorite lake, river, wherever you're at. Find a deep water spots near a creek, like a point or, a, you know, over the tops of brush piles or humps or anything that might be in deep water or just, you know, where bass are congregating. Cast that thing over the top of them. Let it sink down to your desired depth. It normally, they normally sink with eighth or three sixteenths heads about a, a foot a second. Let it sink down and then just engage your reel and just slowly reel that thing as slow as possible. I found that the slower you move that thing, the, the, the better they're going to react to it. Uh, do you still fish shallow during a cold front? Uh, it just depends on the time of year. I mean, if it's a uh, it's still kind of a warming trend, but, you know, a cold front pops up. You can still fish shallow and find some fish there. Typically, they'll just move off a little bit. If you just move a few feet deeper, if you move next to cover that's a little bit deeper, such as a secondary point or just logs in deeper water, they'll typically just move back to there. So you can kind of pattern them that way. I think that was, I think that was all the questions for now. Okay, well, uh, uh, back to just some uh, some locations and different things that are working. Uh, Lake Greason right now, I spoke to guide Matt Baker earlier this week. He's catching a lot of fish still on an umbrella rig, like a Yum Flash Mob Junior, rigging it up with Yum Scottsboro swim baits. That's his favorite swim bait. He sent me a picture of a 10-pounder he actually caught this week. So if you're around Lake Greason, if you're in any distance, drive there, fish, because it's, it's doing good right now. They're still on a more of a pre-spawn kick there. So uh, umbrella rig, a, a jig, or a, uh, a creature bait dragged around brush piles or deep water is working right now. Uh, as far as Lake Hamilton, I've just gotten notes on several big striper and several, uh, several you know, good spotted bass being caught also on an umbrella rig this time of year. Uh, Flash Mob Junior from Yum, we got a good one there. Cast that thing around uh, in docks or any type of you know, cover that's in above 10 foot, of, 10 foot of water or so. Lake Dardanelle spoke to Sawyer Grace, one of our pro staff members at Pradco, and he said things are just moving farther along in the spawn. Fish are shallow, fish are deep, but he said he's starting to catch fish on a, a yum dinger, a frog, a spinner bait, some of that really fun stuff that we've talked about here, power fishing. So if you're, if you're nearby Lake Dardanelle, give some of these power fishing techniques a try, a crankbait, a spinner bait, some of the things that we've talked about. 
those are just a few lakes from people I've reached out to that have given me some good reports. I recommend fishing anywhere you can this this weekend, though. It's supposed to be really nice across the state. Earlier, we had someone ask about um, some um, suggestions for Northeast Arkansas. Northeast Arkansas. You biologists might be a little more uh, apt to know what the lakes are up there. I'm, I'm sure not not familiar with it. Yeah, I mean, it's going to have a lot of small lakes up there, and uh, a lot of them tend to be fairly turbid. So uh, one lake that I'm kind of familiar with up there is Lake Frierson. Um, I wouldn't say it has a ton of bass in it, but the bass that are in it are really good. Um, I mean, and they're really solid fish. So just a lot of three, four, five pound fish in there. And because that water is turbid, these power fishing techniques, and there's a lot of water willows, so your spinner bait and your bladed jig would be both really good bets there. Um, and then and that's, that kind of goes for a lot of the lakes that are up in Northeast Arkansas. They're all kind of these smaller and uh, maybe a little bit more muddier water lakes. And these, these techniques that we talked about today, I think would be great up there. What about stock ponds? Well, these, these same lures are going to work in ponds right now. Ponds are going to warm up quicker typically because they're smaller bodies of water. They're shallower. So anything like a spinner bait, a bladed jig, a frog, a buzz bait, anything good, shallow presentation should work right now. And then, Bob, what size weight do you normally use on a Texas or a Carolina rig? Uh, for, for Texas, uh, as light as possible is what it seemed to work for me and for people that I fish around, a quarter or a five-sixteenths something of that nature so it's got a real soft flutter on it uh, unless you're fishing around heavy cover I mean if you're fishing around grass or anything where you need it to drop quicker go up to like a half ounce uh, and in a Carolina rig a three quarters ounce that's that's all you need is a lead three quarter ounce sinker and you're good to go right. I think I got all the questions so Jeff and Vic I have a question for y'all so can y'all just give me what you're, um, so right now, if you were to go out and say, I'm going bass fishing right now, where are you going and what kind of, um, what, what are you going to use? Um, like I kind of said earlier, uh, I'm really partial to the bladed jig this time of year. Um, and I keep on seeing big bass coming out of lower White Oak Lake right now. So that would probably be I'd travel down and go to Lower White Oak Lake because I see people catching 10 pounders out of there like crazy right now. Now, are they real pictures or are they like fisherman tails? No, these, this guy that I know is catching them. He's a he full on, knows what he's doing and he's, okay. he's catching them. So um, they're, they're big fish and uh, that'd probably be my place to go right now if I could go anywhere. I'm getting ready to move to the Lake Maumel area. So I want to learn that reservoir and my go-to this time of year, I tend to be a little bit more of a subtle fisherman as opposed to power fishing. So a Texas rig lizard is probably what I'm going to do and, and try to um, try to anger some bass into biting your nest or your structure. And then, um, Bob, hold on a moment. I'll get right to you. So can y'all, just in your comments, um, tell me, go ahead and put down what kind of um, rig setup you, you think y'all might use. If y'all were to go out right now and go bass fishing, what kind of, um, what would y'all use? Some of the techniques that Dustin talked about, what would be something y'all would use? I didn't know it was called a Texas rig, but that's normally what I would use. <laughs> hard Texas rig. Yeah. I used to work on the lower white oak as still I used to work on the lower white oak as a still clerk and have seen eight to fifteen pound bass caught from there. Ooh, that's awesome. You got a jig, lizard, shad, shallow crank bait. Say that five times fast. Mm -hmm. Bladed jig sounds like a good one to use. Buzz baits are just fun. Mm -hmm. Fun. First choice is a spinner bait. If that doesn't work, Texas rig with a crawl. There you go. Good. Cool. All right. So let me get back to Bob's. So Bob said, okay, Beaver Lake is tough. Can you help us out up here? Uh, I actually lived at Beaver Lake. I went to college up there and I lived there for five years and fished Beaver Lake about every week, it seemed like. And 
I hated it. It wasn't very fun, but it seemed like there was times when you could catch a lot of fish and a lot of good fish, actually. And this time of year, like March leading up to the spawn, uh, like to go as far up the river as possible. I mean, I know they, the War Eagle Rivers, they call one section of it up there. If you go up really far up there, you start getting into dirtier water. You can throw things like this spinner bait or a bladed jig. And that's, that's what I recommend doing. Go way up the river, go to where the water gets dirty and you'll find some shallow fish that are easier to catch. So don't hang out in the lake, huh? Hey, it's fun if you just want to hang out, but <laughs> fishing's a little easier. Yeah, you know. All right. All right. Do you have any other questions right now? You did have on here that you're going to talk a little bit about the Arkansas River. Does you have any um, any suggestions about on the Arkansas River fishing? Uh, currently, just you know, talking to people that are fishing around Fort Smith or, or Kerr, which is over in Oklahoma, fishing's getting good there. There's a lot of people catching fish around grass beds using a spinner bait or even a swim jig. It's starting to catch them on a swim jig, but recommend getting out there, fish around grass, fish around any type of shallow cover. They're moving up, getting ready to spawn. Uh, highly recommend something with red on it. Get you a spinner bait like this Warrior River ad or a Booyah spinner bait like our Covert series. It has red or orange on it. Highly recommend that. Any signs behind? <laughs> no, they're sure in, but Jason Christie catches a lot of fish on them, and I trust him a lot more than myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's fine. Vic, no, you. Do we have another research project? I think we're going to have to do a lot of fishing. It sounds like, and it looks like <laughs> we've got some some people on the chat here that would be willing to help us out. So, uh, I do want to. Just thank everybody for the thoughtful questions tonight. It's been terrific. It's really made for a, a more engaging and conversational webinar. Uh, 